So, Renato, is Hunter Biden pursuing a winning legal strategy? It's complicated. I'm Renato Mariotti. I'm a former federal prosecutor, a practicing lawyer, and a legal analyst. And I'm Asha Rangappa. I teach national security law at Yale University. I'm a former FBI special agent, and I'm a legal contributor for ABC News. And we're here to help you understand topics that can't be boiled down into a soundbite or a tweet. So, Asha, I have to say, uh, Hunter Biden is a topic we haven't discussed in a while. It came to the fore this week uh, because there was this whole circus. I mean, there's a lot of legal circuses uh, this week, uh, but one of them was the re- congressional Republicans trying to have a contempt hearing. And Hunter Biden <laughs> just shows up and is like, yeah, I'm ready to testify. This whole thing's a sham. Very interesting strategy. I thought that was, I mean, fr- frankly, I thought it was kind of hilarious because <laughs> he came and he sat down, you know, right there. And the committee, you know, was, as you said, was having this hearing to whether to vote um, Hunter in contempt of Congress. And then you had the Democrats saying, well, he's here. Let's hear from him. And most of the Republicans didn't want to. Um, and I think. Well, I'm interested to know what your take was it on that. I saw that as a move to muddy the waters in terms of if he was voted in contempt of Congress, the ability of the Justice Department to move forward in in enforcing that, which I'm not sure they would do. But like um, anyway, but in other words, he's showing a willingness to come in, which would undercut. I think a criminal prosecution of um, a willful, you know, defiance uh, of a subpoena, similar a, a little bit to what Meadows did. I think, like there, there is sort of a good faith showing. Yeah, I think you've you've hit the nail on the head. I think there's two reasons why. I think that's the primary one, and we should we'll put in the comments to uh, in the YouTube or in the episode the letter from there's a we'll a link to the letter that counsel for Hunter Biden sent the committee afterwards. And essentially their letter, I think, reflects the strategy you just mentioned, Asha, which is you can't hold Hunter in contempt because he's trying to comply. And actually your original subpoena to him wasn't valid because there wasn't an impeachment inquiry at the time. If you reissue the subpoena, he will comply. Um, But he was essentially um, making a show of the fact that, hey, I will comply, and presumably his attorneys would um, would mention that and make an issue of that, because then from a criminal law perspective, essentially, if you prosecuted him, uh, then the jury would essentially be asked to say, well, he wanted to testify publicly. The subpoena says, you know, essentially that this is for a private deposition, and so, the you know, whoever issued the subpoena controls that, and it's just, it's much more... It's much more complicated. There's definitely a risk that jurors are going to not want to hold someone criminally uh, responsible for trying to dictate how they um, how they uh, do this. And I think that the um, the uh, analogy to Meadows is a great one, Asha, because he avoided uh, the contrast between him and, let's say, Steve Bannon um, is 100 percent due to the strategy that they uh, pursued or Peter Navarro. Uh, there's another example, 100%. Yeah, who both just completely stonewalled. Uh, Meadows had uh, some other, I think, um, blurring of the lines in terms of, you know, to what extent he, you know, his communications were privileged, et cetera, et cetera, that the Justice Department may not have wanted to wade into at that point. But I think to the point of the a jury, I mean, the physically showing up also, I think, is powerful. Um And I know that this was a point made by Democrats on the committee, you know, during the hearing was, you know, Chairman Comer has publicly extended this invitation to testify and has made it clear that he can do it publicly um, or in a closed door deposition. And so he's chosen to come here and do it publicly. So I think that was sort of, it, it seemed like a little bit of a sticking point is that the Republicans 
wanted to take this behind closed doors. They don't want him to testify publicly, which I think gets to the other legal strategy, which is to expose the sham, which is, you know, this is all about all these allegations that have been put out there. uh, But yet when it comes to allowing the American people to just hear what Hunter has to say, I mean, we're not talking about classified information here or anything um, that they they don't want that to be out in public. Yeah, I mean, I think the way I would put it, I th- I, I agree with everything you said, uh, and I I think I mentioned early on, I th- I thought you were right on. There's a sec, but I said like there's a secondary strategy, and I think the secondary strategy is you know for someone in Hunter Biden's situation, pursuing a traditional legal strategy is not going to work because Hunter Biden is indicted for crimes that there's probably not going to be a lot of dispute in the evidence that he actually committed. In other words. You know, he pro- he probably did f- falsely put some, uh, you know, a, a check a box on a form saying that he was not a drug addict when he was. Or maybe he didn't fully pay his taxes. And the issue for him is just he's getting indicted for crimes that most people wouldn't get indicted for. He's getting sort of there's a, pro- a abuse of prosecutorial discretion there. And the defense's view of it, I presume, is that he is getting a hard line against him or the DOJ is throwing the book at him because of the disinformation campaign and, or I wouldn't even, maybe a disinformation campaign is a wrong, a wrong statement. Although I, there's an element of it because they're, the Republicans are turning him into some boogeyman, but I think partly just this sort of how he's become a, a, a cause celeb on Fox news and who his father is and so on. And I think what his legal team is trying to do, is they're trying to fight back against that. And they're realizing that the only way for Hunter Biden to get a reasonable resolution here is to try to change the public's view of Hunter Biden and try to fight back against that narrative. Yes. And so you're just so our listeners are aware, because there was there were a lot of circuses last year. In addition to the contempt hearing in Congress, Hunter Biden was also arraigned in court on his uh, tax charges, uh, which included, I believe, six misdemeanors and three felony charges of his failure to pay income tax going. This is this goes back to an investigation that started in 2018. Um, This it was part of the plea deal that fell apart last August. And uh, right under the wire, as after David Weiss was became a special counsel, on the Hunter Biden case, because before that he was just the U.S. attorney for Delaware that had continued in his position. He was made a special counsel and right under the wire of the expiration of the statute of limitations, um, he filed these charges. So um, and and what you're saying is. Well, I'm interested to to know you. So you feel I can totally see what you're saying with the showing up. um in person. And I wouldn't even call it a disinformation campaign. I think it's just a straight up smear campaign, right? Like it's just throwing some mud, Mm -hmm. trying to create some um, guilt by association to his father. Uh, You think that saying screw it to the plea deal when the Department of Justice was unwilling to say this will be the end of the story um, and allowing those charges to go forward is also a part of trying to kind of reclaim his own narrative i guess i mean i maybe what you're saying is that they are going to try to file motions saying that this is a selective prosecution or uh, and get this dismissed i think it's a little bit different i mean i'm not saying necessarily that they're going to file motions get it dismissed but i think they're hoping that if they can change the narrative publicly a little bit that the the at the end of the day years from now when this case finally gets to a trial I, you know or something along those lines they'll be able to get a a reasonable resolution out of the special counsel because once the election's over and, and once Hunter can kind of change the narrative and correct the record a little bit, there won't be so much fervor over getting, you know, every pound of flesh that they can get out of Hunter Biden. I think that's what they're hoping for. I think that, you know, the reason he rejected the plea deal is because the plea deal was I thought harsh, and I argued that in a column in Politico at the time. I thought the plea deal was harsh, but obviously the right move if the alternative is to get charged and potentially, you know, face 
you know, the prosecutor asking for prison time, you do it, you know, a hundred times out of a hundred if you're a defense counsel. But if you're, if you think you're going to get indicted anyway, it's not a great deal. <laughs> There's no point in, in pleading guilty to some uh, in crimes if you're going to get indicted for the rest and have to fight those anyway. And so I think he did it for that reason. But I think now his legal team's like, okay, well, how do we fight this? Uh, having a traditional strategy where we're like, well, I actually did pay my taxes is pro- probably not going to work. So they've got to come up with something outside the box. And I think this was their attempt to do so. Yeah. And the point that he paid his taxes, I guess what you're saying is it's not a, it's not necessarily a defense to the charges because he didn't pay his taxes earlier, but that typically in such a situation is, if I recall what you've said, Renato, that when someone for, for the amounts of money that we're talking about and when someone has actually back paid all of the taxes, that this is not something that the Justice Department would bring as a criminal matter as opposed to, say, a civil matter where they would fine you or something. Right. I mean, usually, I mean, this, for example, when the deal was first struck, okay, this, they, these were all failure to pay taxes. And usually when you fail to pay your taxes, you get like a letter from the IRS saying, hey, you, you filed your tax return, but you didn't pay the full amount. Uh, here's all the penalties and interest and so on. It, it's just, it's a very harsh charge. And if for example, you know, Hunter's last name was Trump. Everyone would be like, why are we being so harsh on, you know, Ivanka Trump or Tiffany Trump or whatever, when the average person wasn't being treated this way? One of the ironies here is even though I think the DOJ is being very harsh against Hunter Biden, in part perhaps to show the impartiality of the DOJ, um, it, he, he's being portrayed as somebody getting some sweetheart deal anyways, which makes no sense, like getting indicted for multiple crimes is not a great deal. Right. I would just like to highlight the irony that the same people who feel that this is a completely uh you know justified set of charges are completely fine with the fact that Trump built the state of New York out of however many hundreds of thousands of dollars in taxes because of his, you know, fraudulent business activity. Like that's a witch hunt. But this is OK. I I just like, you know, I, I when when I draw these connections and, and the. Disparate standards, it makes me mad. Yeah, I've tried to be pretty consistent. I think you and I, for example, were critical. We didn't weren't going to prejudge the matter. But let's say on the Fonnie Willis uh, allegations, you know, we gave our views last week. Um, and I think, you know, we, we are not going to defend if if their allegations are true. We're not going to defend the indefensible. Um, it's interesting, of course, that the, the, the difference uh, in, in folks on the Republican side of the aisle, anything related to Trump is good. Everything related to Biden is bad. Hunter Biden is not defensible as a person. He obviously made some very bad personal decisions, but uh, I think we need to prosecute people equally no matter who they are. I mean, I'm just curious what you see moving forward on all of these fronts. So there was this letter that was sent to the congressional committee. Um, then, you know, they're they're fighting this charge in in court um, on the tax charges, as you mentioned, there's this anomaly in, in kind of how they're treating this. I assume that there's also some, you know, a similar claim to be made on the gun charge. And in some ways, you know, the the law coming out of other jurisdictions on these types of, you know, uh, enforcement of gun ownership prohibitions sort of helps Hunter's case, I suppose. So there's also some legal um, boost that he might be getting from the way that these federal pro- gun prohibitions are being uh, treated. Right. I mean, the issue for Hunter on the gun side is that he was a drug addict, specifically, so I think how it starts in the, uh, in the indictment, while he you know possessed a firearm. And there's a serious question about whether that's constitutional under the Second Second Amendment jurisprudence that the right wing has championed, ironically, over the last uh, couple decades. But separate and apart from that, I, I cited statistics in my column about this. I mean, almost no one's charged for this. You probably yeah. could go to a gun show in Texas uh, and uh, find a lot of people there uh, who would violate <laughs> that. It's just it's it's something that the federal prosecutors generally have better things to do than misdemeanor uh, or, or even if I don't know if that may be a felony, 
uh, you know, possessing a firearm while on drugs. Um, I mean, I, I don't know what to make of that. To the extent that there are drug users at gun shows who, you know, wouldn't be guilty of this, it's only because they're buying firearms through private purchases and not through a federally uh, licensed firearms dealer where you would fill out such a form. Yeah. I, I, it is what, yeah, it is what it is. I mean, I just, the whole thing's silly. So in terms of what's going to happen, you asked that question, Ash, I think it's a great one. Um, you know, in his letter, uh, to the, uh, to Comer, uh, Hunter's attorney said, look, we'll comply if you issue a valid subpoena. We weren't going to comply with the last one because it wasn't valid. If they, you know, I suspect Comer is going to try to bring in Hunter again during, um, election season. And there, I guess the question will be, do they get cave in and do it publicly or not? I kind of I don't really understand completely why they want to keep it in private, because having the discussion be about Hunter Biden during a campaign season seems like a great thing for Republicans. Um, but either way, um, I think that's going to go forward. And then by the time any of the Hunter Biden cases get anywhere in terms of any sort of resolution, there's going to be a second term and either Trump's the the president. Um, and frankly, I don't know how much worse uh, Hunter Biden would get treated in that in that re- in that uh, regime uh, or Biden uh, will be president. And again, and for all we know, he could pardon his son or commute his sentence or something. Well, I can tell you why they don't want this to be a public hearing, because if Hunter Biden testifies publicly, then you know, the the media ecosystem, the right wing media ecosystem has to cover it. I mean, you know, Fox News watchers are going to want to see what, what Hunter has to say. And I think this committee knows that what he has to say, there's no smoking gun there. They're going to be like, did this email that referred to, quote, the big guy mean your dad? And if Hunter's like, no, I mean, it's sort of like, the, the you know, the, the balloon deflates, right? Like it's it's in their interest to keep these um you know, the insinuations and all of the the bubble, the sus- bubble of suspicion alive um, rather than have someone actually come and lay out facts. Because remember, Hunter Biden is really only valuable to them to the extent that his activities lead to Joe Biden. Because otherwise, who cares? Who cares? Send him to jail. Like, who cares? Like, I don't know. Like, okay, if he committed a crime, if he's, you know, laundering money, whatever. The only reason this would be relevant to the impeachment of Joe Biden is if any of these actually were connected. And I think that they know that they don't have that uh, evidence connecting it. And they know that if he testified, that would become very clear. And I'm sure that, you know, then the mileage that they get from this thing dissipates significantly. Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, it's interesting calculation. I mean, I don't, I'm not a, a, pro, a disinformation expert, uh, but it sure seems to me like you know th- they are great at finding ways of of um, saying one plus one equals three. So you know, I wouldn't be surprised if Hunter Biden testified, and a lot of it was exculpatory. But they didn't, they didn't air any of that. They aired one or two things carefully taken out of context uh, to make him appear otherwise. But yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, it may be that they think it's it's going to create some sympathy for Hunter Biden or what, but it's definitely uh, mm-hmm. a dangerous game to play to dare him to come in and then not have him on there. So they, I think, you know, it's definitely an error there. It's but it's definitely it, it's also, I think, an interesting way. It'll be comparison in our when we talk more about some of Trump's recent activities of how practicing law when you have a very high profile client involves more than just. Um, you know, being in a courtroom, there's a different element to it. Yeah. And I think to your point, it is really about how it's challenging the the typical norms that you have um, or that we've had when it comes to these things. Because one thing I'll, I'll note that I keep reading over and over again is that the White House is not thrilled with Hunter's strategy. They just want him to lay low and keep this all behind the scenes. And this aggressive posture that he's taken, showing up to the committee, allowing the uh, Justice Department to to charge him, um, even bringing the civil suit against the the blind laptop owner in Delaware that had his uh, laptop for hacking, like all of these things that are um, much more aggressive and offensive rather than defensive, um, it's is at odds with I think what 
you know, the administration would want. Um, so it'll be it will be interesting to see how this plays out. Yeah, really good point, Asha. I don't think any of the stuff that Hunter's doing is going to make the Biden campaign or his father very happy. Uh, I think, Joe, uh, you know, Hunter Biden is putting himself and his interests and his freedom first here, which is his right to do. Uh, but there's no question that this is not uh, the strategy that a lot of Democrats would like him to employ. So speaking of legal strategy, um, we are in the middle of the closing arguments for Trump's New York civil fraud trial. And last week, his lawyers uh, closed. Trump was not, he wasn't supposed to be allowed to address the court because he had not agreed to certain stipulations the judge made. But I, I think he pontif- ended up pontificating for like five minutes anyway. Um, and then also there's the E. Jean Carroll second defamation trial going on. Um, so let's, let's talk about legal strategy here. Yeah. I, you know, I think you could draw an interesting parallel between what we just talked about regarding Hunter and the strategy, for example, that Trump employed in the New York uh, fraud trial. So in the, during the fraud trial, he's been pursuing a really non-legal strategy It's apparent. And it's been apparent throughout the entire trial that Trump's going to lose. Um, his attorneys are not really doing the sort of thing that you would expect to move the needle in front of the judge. In fact, they're poking the judge. They're insulting the judge. So is Trump. It's not what you do in a bench trial where there's no jury and the jump and the judge is the decider. But Trump then on the eve of closing arguments has this whole thing like he wants to talk himself. You're not letting him talk and putting the judge, the judge in a difficult position either. He allows Trump to spew a bunch of nonsense that becomes the the story for the day. Or he tells Trump not to speak, in which case the campaign and Trump make that into the story. The judge won't let him speak. And as you point out, Asha, in a in a in a uh, trial, it's the lawyers that give closing arguments. And it's totally normal when someone's, for example, pro se, which is the only reason why somebody usually would give their own argument, the judge put ground rules. And the ground rules are very reasonable on Trump, which is you didn't testify at trial, so you can't give testimony. Don't use this as a way of giving testimony where you're not going to be cross-examined. That's very, very right. reasonable. And Trump, Trump's lawyer didn't um, agree to those via email. And then at the trial itself, when the judge asked Trump if he agreed, he didn't agree to that either. He ended up, uh, as you put it, you call it pontificating uh, for a few minutes. That's probably uh, the nicest way possible <laughs> putting what Trump was doing uh, in front of the judge. Yeah. Uh, and and through the course of that little speech, he violated the things that the judge told him. I mean, and basically, I think the judge was like, you know, you can't accuse the attorney general of, you know, political bias um you can't attack the court you can't attack the court staff uh basically all the stuff that trump loves to do and then he continued to do it i mean so those were the ground rules but and it's and i assume his lawyer didn't agree to them because they knew that trump wouldn't adhere to them so right yeah and and in that moment you know the way it was described by people in the room was that the judge asked trump will you comply with x y and z and then trump didn't respond and then just started talking. And in that, you know, one thing I'll just say, because we've talked about this in other episodes, in different context uh, show, you know, we've talked about, for example, how would Trump's lawyers get in to the uh, record in front of the jury? All of these like statements that, that mm-hmm. Jack Smith's trying to keep out. The truth of the matter is, is that judges in trials have ground rules about how the trials are going to work and lawyers and some occasionally, mostly lawyers, but sometimes litigants violate them. And judges have various ways that they can enforce their rules. And, you know, it's interesting here. I mean, part of what happened here is the judge hesitated. And a, a trial, if you hesitate even a second, you often give an opening for the attorney or the litigant in this case or the witness to do something that you wouldn't want to have happen. He really should have acted immediately and shut Trump down. But separately from that, I would just say that, you know, you know, this is, I think, a a, a point that we all have to 
I think realize is that Trump does get treated differently from others. I, I mean, there are a lot of bizarro defendants who file frivolous lawsuits and say stupid things and thumb their nose at the court. And I don't think they would get the level of deference. They wouldn't be asked to comply with rules in the same way that Trump did. Well, you know, he has a platform and a prominence that most other defendants have. And I think that what he did in court is really just what we've seen over and over again since he ran, started running for office in 2016, which is he makes the the primary claim, the the you know, a priori claim that the system is against him. Okay. This and this is why he needs to be the person because he's going to buck the system because it's all against him. It's all rigged, et cetera. Then he proceeds to blow through all norms and any attempt to actually reestablish those norms or enforce them becomes evidence that the system is against him and rigged. So it proves his point. It's like this very brilliant strategy, right? Like, you know, the mainstream media is against me. When they interview him, He'll just start barreling ahead. He won't answer the questions. He'll just t tell his lies. If anyone tries to check him on his lies, then that is, you know, evidence that they are against him and trying to make him look bad. So he's done this and now he's doing it with the court system. Um, and it's just, it really places everyone who wants to play by ground rules in this catch-22 situation, just like it did with the judge. If the judge cut him off when he started talking, he let him talk for like five minutes, I think. Right. Um, he was going to prove Trump's claim, you know? So he's like in this like weird no man's land of like having to kind of make sure that Trump doesn't have fodder for his narrative, but also like trying to keep order in the court. And Trump is just a master of, um, turning it all on its head. Yeah, speaking of turning it all to, on its head, I mean, one thing that really frustrated me to see, Asha, was that Trump was essentially employing a strategy we've seen him employ over and over and over again, which is changing the story, changing the narrative by creating a more shiny object for the media to pay attention to. So, you know, he is on trial for fraud. The trial has not gone well for him. It looks like he's going to be having to pay hundreds of millions of dollars. His business is not going to be uh, able to continue to function in the state of New York and so on. And yet, what's the news story that's being covered? Um, I don't know. I was on, four, on TV four times that day on two different networks, on MSNBC and CNN, talking about this. And what were all the questions about Trump's antics, about this this nonsense with the judge that you and I have been discussing and so forth? I was on MSNBC while Trump was get, you know finishing up and making his statements. And then during the closing argument by the attorney general's office, while the attorney general's office was giving their closing argument, Trump left the courtroom, gave a speech in front of a bunch of American flags and MSNBC cut away from me discussing like his disinformation to cover his speech in front of all the American flags in which he was spewing all sorts of false statements. And it's the same thing we've seen over and over again. And there's a lot at stake in this election. So it's it's really interesting to me that I feel like no matter how much we think the media has adapted to the disinformation tactics, I think that they really haven't uh, done a good enough job. And ultimately, I think you know, Trump is playing them like he did four years ago and six and eight years ago. hundred percent. And to your example that you mentioned, when they were covering him in front of all the American flags, they were not covering the closing arguments that the attorney general was making and the merits of the case. I mean, basically what you're saying is he totally took the attention off the merits of the case, which was that he was overinflating the value of his assets for the purposes of getting favorable loan terms and, uh, you know, whatever, good rates on insurance and then deflating them and avoiding paying taxes, which, again, brings us back to the hypocrisy that, you know, we're not actually covering Trump's avoidance of playing, paying taxes. We're talking about his antics. Um, you know, it's not being covered in the same way that, for example, the Hunter Biden charges are. Right. Which is why I think Hunter Biden's team is like, OK, we got to play by that playbook and create our own mm -hmm. circus. Um, 
And it's interesting because one thing I will say is, you know, to her credit, Robbie Kaplan, who is the lawyer for E. Jean Carroll, saw that Trump is going to do the same thing in the E. Jean Carroll uh, trial that's coming up to determine the amount of money that he owes her for defaming her and so forth. And um, all, and obviously, ultimately, he, you know, he sexually assaulted her, just to be crystal clear about that. But, you know, what she did, Robbie Kevin put that in front of the judge. Like, hey, judge, he's going to be trying to flout your rules. He's going to be trying to, te- you know, testify via statements. He's going to be trying to do all these things. Don't let him do it. So it's interesting. And again, this goes to the steamrolling over norms and, you know, rules that we have, because normally when you get a huge judgment against you for defamation, you know, you realize that there's a cost to making these statements and you stop making them. Um, Trump kept making them. So that's why he's being sued again. And actually, I was just on Twitter before we got on and saw a tweet from Lisa Rubin, who is um, covering the trial for MSNBC. And she was waiting outside to get in. And she said, while I'm waiting, I just saw that Trump has defamed E. Jean Carroll again on Truth Social. And so it kind of gets to, you know, what I was saying earlier, like, what do you do with someone who simply refuses to comply? I mean, what, what's the what's the end game here? Like, they just keep suing him or, you know, does the court finally, you know, order some kind of like put, hold him in contempt? I, you know, and again, that will just prove his case that everybody's against him. But in other words, what what kind of rule like what what can rein him in is, I think, the big question. Yeah, a really good one, Asha. That's a really great question. I mean, think in the civil context, in the context of the defamation, you know, in part, he could view that as part of the, quote, cost of doing business, you know. Companies do um, sometimes decide that the the value that they get from violating a rule or regulation or law outweighs any penalty. So, you know, your your delivery, I'm not going to name any companies here, but certain delivery companies may just decide, you know, we're just going to not, you know, we're not going to follow the parking rules. We're going to park our delivery trucks in the middle of the road and we're going to take the parking tickets because we need to keep our delivery service running and the costs of paying the parking tickets is just part of the cost of doing business. On a much larger scale, there are some financial institutions and companies that make decisions that certain regulatory penalties are just part of the cost of doing business. You know, for Trump, I think defaming E. Jean Carroll and flouting the legal system, you know, paying some millions of dollars eventually to E. Jean Carroll may be okay to him. And if the judge just finds him again and it's like, okay, you're paying another 100K, you're paying another this, that's just part of the cost of doing business. I think he realized perhaps too late that the penalties in the New York AG's case were so high that that's like something he can't afford to to just not, you know, to not take seriously. He found out, I think he figured that out a little too late. But I do think in the civil side, there's that risk. And the criminal side, of course, it's different. I mean, there the penalties can be very significant, but I think we've talked at length about the issues there. So a lot of you have been asking, and I've had some of you ask me on Twitter, like, what's the trial that's going to hurt Trump the most or hold Trump accountable? And I think really, you know, none of these civil trials have that capability from my perspective. They're, they'll hurt him. In, the, the New York AG trial will hurt him in his pocketbook eventually, very significantly. But whether that's going to change his behavior, God only knows at the age of, was he, 77? Um, he may just decide that he doesn't, you know, he has no more Fs left to give, so to speak, about any of that. Uh, on the criminal side, you know, what really what depends uh, on is what happens before the election. And I think, you know, given that we're just recording this after Trump handily won the Iowa caucuses, um, realistically, um, in the months to come, I think that that decision is going to ultimately be who's the president and whether a trial can happen before he uh, gets elected one way or the other. Um, that's going to going to be a a big topic of conversation for months to come. I have a slightly different take, which is I actually think he cares very much about the New York civil fraud trial. I think that gets to the heart of his identity and his self-image. And especially if he's prohibited from 
engaging in business. And also, I think because he psychologically has, feels like it's an ex existential threat to have his livelihood and money taken away. And I think that will make him even more desperate to use the presidency, not only to exact revenge against his opponents and everything, but basically uh, transactionally. Um, it, it will make him want to profit from the presidency uh, even more than he did the first time around. And we haven't really made a, done a sub segment on it, but at this point there is um, a House, a, a report by Democrats on the House Oversight Committee showing that Trump profited by about what $7.8 million from foreign governments during his time. So I think that will just become... He'll see, he'll see the U.S. Treasury as his personal piggy bank, I think. So, Asha, I, I have had to deal with a lot of very difficult weather conditions in Chicago over the years. This week has been really bad. Um, when I went to see my mom to have lunch with her recently, it was negative 40 degrees, wind chill negative 10 degrees outside. It's been incredibly cold, lots of snow, lots of canceled school days. How are things uh, over in Connecticut? Well, today's a snow day. Um, there's not that much snow, but um, it has been cold. And I'm not a big fan of the cold. I honestly, like, I don't understand how I ended up in Connecticut, to be honest. <laughs> I'm just like, where did, how did my life like path bring me here? Um, I have you ever gotten frostbite? I have not. Uh, I am actually very worried about that all the time. I'm like one of those hyper bundled up people. Like I have like special those special gloves. Like if you go to wherever Amazon or whatever, you can find these gloves that like protect you up to X temperature. Like I have that stuff, and I'm always okay. putting super bundled. Are you? Yeah, that's smart. Um, so I'll, I'll tell you my frostbite story. So when I was younger. We used to, and I grew up in Virginia, um, every Christmas holiday, we would take a trip up north to go skiing at uh, many of the resorts in the Northeast. And when I was 12 years old, we went to Killington. And this was back in the day before you had to wear helmets and all of these kinds of things. And I was like, I might've been 13. I, I, I was 12 or 13, but I wanted to look cute on the slopes um and so i can't remember if i was wearing a hat i can't remember i definitely was not wearing a face mask i i have no idea what my entire face and head i think were exposed and it was um 40 degrees below zero so i mean so, like with the wind chill it was like something really insane really insane and as my sister and I started going up the lift, it was so cold. I started crying and then my eyes froze shut because the tears immediately froze in my eyes. So I couldn't like open my eyes. And my sister like looks over and she says, your face is white. Like she saw that my face was turned white. So she like puts her um, mittens over my face to like cover it. And if you've been to Killington, it's a very large mountain. It took us like 20 minutes to get up to the top. As soon as I got to the top, you know, she got like some ski patrol and they put me in the um, little toboggan and like <laughs> bring me down. And I like my cheeks turned black because it, like I've got frostbite all over my cheeks. And um, I was like traumatized because I was like, what if this is my face for the rest of my life? You know what well, I mean? Yeah, Just, I get it. Yeah. So um Anyway, that's my frostbite story. And I mean, I, it took like it took like two months. It like peeled and then it was like this Ugh. raw pink and I have dark skin. So I was like, I was like, is this going to scar? Wow. So, I, you know, <laughs> the cold scares me. Uh, <laughs> I can see why. Do you, I, you bundle I, up now? I bundle up a lot. Yeah. Um, I'm always uh, I, I just have to like I, I can't deal with any type of cold and i'd still ski but now i cover my face and i have like you know electric socks and like everything 
Yeah, ever since I I'd, I'd had a surgery some years ago and guy was sick. So ever since then, I've, I'm super cold. So I like wear – you probably – anyone who watches our YouTube version of this notices that I'm always in like hoodies and stuff. I'm always bundled up. I always have layers all the time, even at home. Uh, and when I'm out, like I'll have like those like – super on you know super uh inner layer sort of things i'm sure you've seen those before my wife picks these things up at costco where it's like you know super warm under layer mm-hmm. stuff so i get those i have those and i have all sorts of special layers because i am just i get super cold easily and i just can't deal with um, fleece leggings are my favorite fleece leggings okay i don't know if that would work for me as well as it no, works probably not but, but but your wife would like them <laughs> indeed indeed but in all seriousness it does matter and you know what the, the it's been so cold here recently little henry has not even like going outside which is something okay usually he's out there hunting uh trying to find something out there and and playing out in the snow he loves to eat the snow um but even for henry this is like a, a nope sort of moment like he'll go out when he really has to to go to the bathroom and like rush right back in well if it's really cold he'll pee his pee will freeze <laughs> And his little paws will freeze because he will not accept anything at his paws. So there you go. Even no matter how cold it is. Mm, Poor Henry. M S W Media.